Hello. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Um, Jessica, I forgot to add that Rob is, Rob, who will be having a conversation with me afterward, is my friend of 25 years. And so, although some of the friendships in this book um, didn't make it long term, I just want you to know I'm capable of it. <coughs> I'm going to read to you from the beginning of this book. Uh, is this, can you hear me well? Okay. <coughs> this is the opening chapter. Patricia will be late. As I think this, with a tolerant fondness, she texts that she'll be late. It doesn't bother me. I've known her 18 years, and she confirms herself, the deeply known friend, which reminds me of love in its greatest warmth, its common comfort. I haven't seen her in months. After her father died a few years ago, she left Missoula with her family, took a job two hours away. Our email is sporadic and bright, not more than that. We have our work, our teenagers, family health concerns, etc. None of these intersects anymore. She comes to town once in a while, stays with her mother, and sometimes, last minute, we squeeze in a lunch. Otherwise, our correspondence has lapsed into late delivered major news. My father has died in New York where I grew up, and I've been dazed for months home in Missoula, yet not home. I hunger all the time and nothing answers me. Absence the new habit, I am shedding people, no longer sure how to show interest, how to let friends care, but I need care. And Patricia's has always been keen, persuasive. With her sweet intention, she might make me visible again. Was she coming to town soon, I emailed. She was, and guess what? We're moving back. A flicker of gladness. We made a date, but her weekend changed. We had to postpone. That used to make me crazy. Patricia pulls into the metered spot as I'm passing it on the sidewalk, and she waves hugely before shutting off the car, as if she can't wait to get out. The windshield frames her gathering ups, the strap of her bag onto her shoulder, familiar motion. In a second, we'll reunite, and she'll shower me with enthusiastic greeting. I remember there's a song we do. I can't sing. After I arrived in Montana, 27 years old, Patricia became my guiding, buoyant older sister. She jollied me along, made things regular when I found them a regional confusion. When we met, her encouraging pursuit, my ready affections, we each had one dog and one cat, one husband, well, boyfriend for me. Both of us were earning a little money as freelance writers. Our birthdays were close together. She delighted in these coincidences as if they were delicious and rare overlaps. Later, when we were interested in having babies, we wondered how it would affect our writing. We asked, where will we find the time? Not believing we had to worry. At one point, I had a therapist I liked and recommended, and Patricia started to see her too. Sometimes, our coats in our arms, we passed in the waiting room, which always amused us because we had steady plans with each other every few days. Hey, sweetie, she'd cry, her greeting big, no matter the room. I didn't know you were coming on Mondays now. When she took a leave from her job at a magazine, she put me up for the interim position. Every morning, sitting in her chair, I logged her password into her office email account for the day's business. We had a long period of doubleness. Patricia embraces me, the musical surge of, hello, how are you? Her raised voice exclaiming, just getting away from the kids. Her mother's with them, she says. I try to match her and relate, which feels nice, nudges me closer even though to me, such family reliance is peculiar. I know, I say, some time to ourselves, but I embody strain. How are you, she repeats. I'm so sick of it here, I say. I don't want to look at this town anymore. Don't say that, I'm about to move back. That's true, I'm glad. Inside the bar, we debate tables. It's afternoon. I texted, shall we drink? She wrote back, hell yeah, which made me smile. She always had the bomb, gave me a glad heart. Music overhead, a call to a crowd that doesn't mind it. We are drowned out. 
Close to my ear, she says, where we can talk. I nod. God, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. I take her in, really. She looks older. I must look older. We pick a corner table with a right-angled banquette. The waitress comes, and Patricia treats her warmly and agrees to the suggested wine. The waitress goes away for the wine and my whiskey. At first, Patricia's absence, as brutal as her unsold house unoccupied a few blocks from mine, beat at me. I'd send a card to her new, I'd sent a card to her new address. Don't forget to write, I wrote, meaning it both ways. Don't forget you're a writer. Don't forget me. Gradually, such disorder righted itself. This was life. People moved. It wasn't, after all, disaster. You coped with it. And when I considered it, coping felt like a right step, maturity. We'd grown nimble with changes. Women handle the shifts, keep friendships afloat, in spite of all that other shit and demand, the being needed. We start our protocol, the updates of our children first. It's been eight or 10 years since her children have had an impact on me, although I remember how the corral of new motherhood contained our friendship, limited us. When our kids were babies, toddlers, then starting school, we'd shared kitchens and rooms and cluttered activities. We knew the arsenic hour, as Patricia loved to call it, not yet dinner time, the house filled with doom and shrieks, and nothing worked, no entertainment, no fruit, no limits. We'd phone each other, I know, I know, we said back and forth, the din at our backs. We take turns. Does Daniel have a Facebook account? Does Tasha, has he friended you? Do you recognize her friends? And I listen not for the information, I'll forget most of it by evening, the family's constant details enough, my tattered mind empty each night, but for what's at work in her heart and surfacing. We have different styles. Patricia starts with the reports. I start with mood. I pierce, hunt for the biggest truth, restless until I've divined it. People, new acquaintances, old friends, tell me I'm intense, sometimes too much. Are you never simple? A friend once asked, just wanting a hello. Patricia, <laughs> Patricia, light at the outset, asks questions twice. First for the information, propping that up like a painting against the wall. Then she steps back, asks again, mulls feeling. The eddy of her repetitions used to annoy me. I just answered that, I'd think. Aren't you paying attention to me? But deep knowledge has replaced irritation, wiped away the personal grievance. She is herself. She is like this. And I know myself, reflexively anxious that I won't be properly heard. In the security of true knowing, these traits can be set aside. She pours out details of her return, and I spark and lift. Sun creaks back over a mutual world. Next month, she'll be here for good. I hear her tell me the real estate logistics, lament the hassle of switching schools, and I offer encouragement, but I'm thinking, me, I get Patricia back. Later, I note I hadn't offered to help. In crude mourning, I don't feel competent at anything. We darken our talk, the tough underlayer I wait for, private hopes, the kids' real scares, and questionable behavior, uncertain parenting, sex in our lives, silent humiliations, hatreds. Then we come to our fathers. Our grieving spreads over the table. She says things I've heard her say about her dad and the event, her frequent echoes. But now I've been repeating myself too, unable to progress from the day of my father's death, the hospital's dull effects, how he was here but is not. And I get it. You go over and over it. You look for sense, try to place yourself, insist. Her father had been dead a few weeks when she collected all she owned, undid her kids' bedrooms, and moved away. I never saw what grief made of her, what she did with it. I couldn't follow. My father was alive. What was I thinking that year, she says, moving then. I must have been out of my mind. I barely remember any of it. Yes, this year, its wash is blinding. What will I recall? How will I return to myself? 
It'll be great to be back. Helena's fine. We've loved the house, but I don't have friends there like this. Only you talk like this. Her voice has settled, shed its vibrant rise and rise. She is just speaking. I have to ask you something, I say. When Jack was born, the first few weeks, you didn't see him. I didn't? No, you didn't come. Was it summer? I'm briefly annoyed. It was November. Both my sons were born in November, Daniel first, Jack four years later. Patricia and I were very close by then. I wonder why I didn't. God, I'm sorry. She looks a little stressed. I don't want that for her. It's okay, I say. I just wondered. This isn't true. I've stored hurt for 10 years and let it seep into the friendship. That's what I should tell her. Come clean, Susanna. Unmask and voice regret. Apologize. A decade on, together in a bar that hadn't existed then. I can't fathom why it's important to bring this up, why I need her to know she hurt me. Except that grief disdains normal procedure, and my behavior keeps surprising me, as if it has snapped off from its source, broken away. I've been accounting for disappointments. Patricia isn't actually one of them. It was Patricia who packed the full Thanksgiving dinner in paper bags and left them covered on our porch the night Christopher and I brought our first newborn home. Until then, she and I had been happy to be friends, glad at the sound of the other's interested voice. But that night, when I'd been a mother for 58 hours, as I dressed my baby in diaper, onesie, fleece bunting, Patricia planned, baked, drove over, and changed our friendship. She marked what mattered between friends, what mattered in a couple, in a town. She showed me how simple you witness and love, and you feel loved. She wasn't asking for anything. Four years later, at the birth of my second son, she hadn't come to the hospital or to the house. Other people dropped by, brought wrapped presents and bouquets. I waited for my deep down friend. She didn't even call. I'd been counting on her to remind me how I fit in this life, how connected I was to solid people. Patricia's eager, easy devotion in the past few years had helped to grant me mothering skills. I didn't have a reliable mother like she did, the experienced model and steady backup. Her mother worked polling tables on election days where she chatted with a stream of lifelong neighbors. My mother, whom Patricia met once in a state of fascinated disbelief, was publicly fabulous and grand with a gesture, but for me, a notorious crisis. She didn't follow through, and when together, we did her, not me. In times of critical transformation, I couldn't have her around. Before knowing me, Patricia wasn't aware such creatures existed. Finally, a couple of weeks later, the time a new baby remakes everything, scrambles all intentions, Patricia appeared. I was mad, fed up. She sat on one end of the couch, I at the other. Jack shielded in my arms until I set him between us. She leaned over him, wowed and wondered, as others had, but there was something stiff. She was distracted. I might have asked, figured her out, led her to open up. I was good at that. But I didn't inquire, a punishment. I didn't let anger go, habit from the dangerous family I'd left behind, from being leery of women. I was good at that too, the guarded disappointment. The moment divided the first years of our friendship from those after. We'd known each other almost a decade when I had Jack, but as I pulled myself in against hurt, I let a single oversight decide our future. Patricia strains to remember why, 10 years ago, she hadn't come. As she reconstructs daily history out loud, I feel dumb. For so long, I'd wanted apology and explanation, but now that I've asked for them, I find neither matters at all. We move on, talk about her mother, how she's managing, about the rearranging in a family when one person dies we didn't used to know. We'd been adding people, choosing people, Patricia puts down her wine. She says, there is nothing that anyone can get past a 45-year-old woman. We laugh hard, the first honest sound I make that afternoon, or in many days, 
each of us feeling the ravages of experience, our debt to enduring. We are not to be fucked with. <clears throat> we rule even as we age and help our children push past us, as we worry about the estimate for the roof, forget things we meant to do, regard our widening bodies, we rule. We've returned again and again to our original selves for another look. We have refined our purpose. Changes we thought we'd been resisting have anyway been wrought, and they have made us unbreakable. On an early spring afternoon, in a dark bar off a sleepy Missoula sidewalk, we sing the unbreakable. We spread out the landscape and, as we've always done, coax narrative out of unruly change. Thank you. I'm very honored to uh, be the uh, interlocutor for Susanna. Susanna and I, as she mentioned, have known each other about 25 years or so. And um, it's uh, always been, uh, she's always been one of my closest, dearest friends. And it's been an interesting friendship because she's been away so much of that time. She's been living in Missoula, we met each other here, but she's been away for a lot of it. So it's a lot of it has been mediated by email and phone calls and things like that. And I'll often hear the names of women who she's friends with. Uh, she'll say, yes, my dearest friend, so-and-so. And it's a name I don't necessarily know. And reading this book was a great education for me because it was it enabled me to sort of follow up on those things and understand the role that these women had had in her life life and, and the, 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 the kind of friendship she had had. So I guess my first question I'd like to ask you is just, what is it about women's friendships you think that are, are distinctive and different uh, that you treat so beautifully in this book? Well, I think that women tend to say things that don't often get said right away by men, necessarily. Um, women, women will go to the heart of the matter quickly. And when you have two I mean, when you have a friendship with, uh, between a man and a woman, um, the woman is the one sort of in charge of that. Um, and when you have two women, um, that is instantly more combustible and inherently more dramatic, as I see it. And, and that, that, that drama is a sort of the leitmotif of the, of the book. I mean, many of these friendships end, uh, as you say, combustible. They end in great drama. They end in... Um, uh, uh, in, in, in not tragic circumstances, but certainly uh, dramatic ones. What is it about the dynamic about friendships with women that you think leads, not always, but so often to that kind of an ending? Well, one of the reasons um, that several of the friendships end, it, that I write about in the book, is because the period of life ends that in which that friend needed to be there or played a crucial role or taught you something about yourself and how to how to move through that period of life so they aren't necessarily ending because there's a conflict um, they just sort of run out um, what was the other part of that? what was <laughs> what why was in the passage you read why was it so important for you to confront Patricia with this this slight that had happened a decade before? You know, I really genuinely didn't know as I heard myself ask her that question. Um, I thought, why am I bringing this up? Do I, do I really need to unpack all of this? And as I realized when she, when I actually said it out loud, I didn't need to unpack it all. And what I concluded was I, I needed a way to mark the, the beginning of a new version of our friendship. Like, I needed, I needed some closure on one way that our friendship had existed and, and one realm in which it had been important um, in order to still keep her as a friend and still be her friend, but, but to, to start a new chapter together, new phase. When, when, when we first met, you were very much uh, 
geared towards uh, being a, uh, a novelist or a writer of fiction in one way or another. Um, you, you know, lived it and breathed it and, 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 you know, there's a certain kind of New York literary type who is, you know, is at work on a novel, a series of short stories, and you were very much that person. Uh, in this book and in your previous book, you have become an expert and a, a, a beautiful writer of memoir, of nonfiction. How did you make that transition? Why did you make that transition? When I was writing fiction, I always had the sense that I was faking something, um, and that I was that I was not really getting at something. Everyone, every character I created um, felt very stiff to me, and and I I felt too much in control of of what I would have them do, um, and what's more, I couldn't I couldn't actually make a genuine connection to anyone I was creating. Um, I mean, I, I've heard that fiction writers can do that, but um, I didn't. Um, and it, and and so, no matter what fiction I wrote, it never really, it never really felt complete to me. Um, and it wasn't until I realized how to use the self as a way of expressing um, connection to to the topic to the people um, that I really felt comfortable with what I was writing and I uh, where I really felt like I had authority to to present something to a reader I, I mean I'm, I'm very interested in that stream just for a selfish reason that NYU I teach literary journalism I run a program on uh, literary reportage and one of the things we champion is the memoir but not the memoir which is you know my, my tale of woe but something we call the reported memoir. Ted Conover, great writer, is on the faculty, and I always think of his writing as being sort of uh, uh, quintessentially representative of what we're trying to do. Because you know, every word that Ted writes is, is about himself, whether he's a hobo riding the rails or going with coyotes or or, or uh, working as a guard in Sing Sing, and yet you'd never call him a memoirist. And I feel like you're exploring this very interesting territory where. You know, you read this book and your previous book not necessarily for you know the, the drama and the stories and the tawdriness of it, though there is that. But you read it for for the, the 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 to watch a sort of intelligent mind in a very literary way, sort of going over the shoals of relationships, whether it's with your mother or your father or your friends. It, it's, it's you're exploring this this genre of memoir in a way that is very different from, I think, what ordinarily is thought of as a memoir. Uh, respond. Well, <laughs> well, let's say that, that Conover goes to Sing Sing and, and he gains access to something that um, no reader has any other way of gaining access to. And then he comes out of that and he brings us that world. Um, to me, that 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 is what I feel I need to do in memoir. It just happens that it's not sing sing; it's the interior of my brain. Sometimes a it much more frightening yeah. place than sing sing. <laughs> but by the way, um, but but it, it's you know I can I can report from there and and convey an impression that there's no other way that you could get um, and maybe in reading that or connecting with it, you can relate it to your own impressions or um, feel the humanity in it just as you would reading the sort of more repertorial stuff um, that, that you're reading for the interest of how someone else experiences an unknown world. And really, every memoir is, is the world of an unknown, it, it's, the, it's the book of an unknown world. It just happens that it's the, the memoirist's head when, when when you first told me you were writing this book I, I have to admit I had a very guy response I thought you know friendships what <laughs> it's sort of women's friendships okay and I really I mean I have to be honest for the first uh, few years of working on it, I really didn't didn't understand uh, and, and, <laughs> and reading it I now do understand um, and I, but one of the things that I think makes this such a powerful book is that, look, a memoir, I mean, you know, part of the, the, the equipment of a memoir is, is a certain level of narcissism, maybe any writer. But yet you have, in, you show yourself, you portray yourself 
so uh, unsparingly uh, throughout this book. I'm wondering about how did you come to terms with representing yourself and portraying yourself in these friendships? Because it, clearly one of the easy accusations to hurl at you is, well, you know, you're seeing it from this distorted. It's sort of the way that, you know, like Truman Capote, everything he wrote, he always sounded good coming out of it. Or, or Nomen Pothara, it's every memoir he writes, he always sounds like the guy who's getting the better of everyone else. You don't do that, and that's one of the reasons it's such a terrific book. H how did you approach the idea, the, the, the prospect of writing about yourself? Um, I feel like it's the only it, it, the, the only thing I can really write about with complete confidence and knowledge and authority is is the deepest stickiest thorniest sometimes ugliest um, thoughts and feelings that I'm having that, that I presume we all have, but we don't necessarily voice them, or in, in common daily life there isn't time to voice them, um, or you don't stop to really notice them, and, and um, so I try, to, I try to do that. And generally what I find is that if you do stop to notice them, and you start to write about them, they get stickier, thornier, and uglier. Um, and uh, it just it just seems to me that that's interesting like like there's a there's a facade that we all maintain going about our daily business with each other in our relationships our friendships um, uh, that we have to maintain so that the world keeps going but um, but I guess I'm always asking what 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 is the undercurrent what's the other thing going on and if you ask that of yourself, um, if, you, if you're asking it of everyone around you, what you realize quickly is you'll never know what, what their undercurrent is. So that throws me back on myself and th that's the only, it's the only thing I can reveal. Um, but I, I just, I feel like it would be, uh, like it would be so obviously, uh, fake if I m made myself look good. Um. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm a wasp, so I, I'm incapable of writing about myself. The idea of writing about myself would make me cringe, so I write about other people. Uh, you have a sort of um, a litmus test about what you should write about, what, the kinds of friendships. Obviously, you had many friendships you haven't written about in this book. What are some of the things that make you run towards a friendship as a writer, make you want to explore a friendship, make you want to explore an experience? Well, I usually start from impression, some, some impression that sticks in memory um, about a friendship I had, say, when I was 15 years old. Like, why, why that girl in my dorm? Why did she stay in my mind? And, um, and there'll be often some sense memory um, that just beckons me and I start to explore it. Um, and what I find writing is that if it makes me queasy, if it really makes me uncomfortable, I have to do that, like that's the only place where something good is gonna come out. Um, so the, the litmus test, I guess, is whether I get nauseous <laughs> <laughs> when I think about it. So writing really is torture for you. Yeah. Literally. Yeah, it's torture. It's sweating blood. I, I know there I know people other people have many questions or some questions anyway, uh, that you like to pose of Susanna. So maybe I'll throw things open. Um, I hate to ask you like a personal question, but the book's so personal and I read it, I don't have any other question to ask really. But to me, I sort of read it as like a memoir of change. There are so many versions of yourself that you present in this book. Like aside from the women that you present, the, every single chapter there's a new Susanna sort of. Um, and I feel like as a writer, you have a very um, tolerant attitude toward the change. You don't really talk about it as much as just sort of there for you to absorb. Um, how was it like a, appropriating all of this change that you went through in your life as you were writing? Was that something that you consciously did or was that just something that came out in the wash? 
you mean how did how did I account for the fact that there were so many different Susannas yes. as I looked at yeah. well that 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 to me is the story I mean that's that's what's that's what I think we get when we reflect on our own lives like God if I if I'd only known when I was 20 what I know when I'm this age um, but but we we are intensely different in all those different stages and um, I, I guess that's how I, uh, th I, I think in some way it keeps me from getting bored when I'm writing it because I don't feel like I'm dealing with the same character of me, um, the same voice. Uh, so even though there's a common thread, it's not, it's not, it's not the same, yeah. Any more questions? There must be. How can you not have a question? There you go. Okay, so this may be kind of a memoir 101 question, but since you're writing about real people and real things, you must feel the need a lot of the time to sort of not tell the whole truth in order to protect people and to protect friendships you might still be maintaining. Do you find tension in that process of trying to protect your friends and relatives and, and people in your life that what, when you're trying to write it and how do you kind of manage that tension? Well, the tension, uh, there is that tension, I think, in anyone who has a friendship with a writer. Like, like um, the, the, the writer, the writer is gonna take stuff and use it sometime, somehow, somewhere. Uh, and I, I'm aware of that responsibility. I mean, I, I'm aware of of um, giving my side of things, uh, and I try to keep it firmly grounded in my side of things, and express from that place what I experienced as going on without saying this was true for that person or this is the truth of that person. Um, but I, I think. I, I mean, I, I know that it's difficult to, to for for people to be written about, even when it's totally loving or totally positive. Um, and in some cases, I actually talk to the friends beforehand, um, n not uh, before publication, not before writing it. But um, and we worked that out, I guess, <laughs> um, in different Same. different ways. <laughs> Uh, one person, one person said, um, this isn't a detail I would be comfortable having my children know, even though her name was changed and biographical information was changed. And, and I, I said, I will, I will work on creating another way for that to show so that your children won't know. Um, so I'm 24, living in the city, kind of going through transitional changes between friendships of, you know, post-college and new life, and there's a lot of changes um, in all of my friends' lives. So what kind of advice, not just, you might not categorize yourself as a friendship expert, but if, um, you know, based on your, based on your research and looking back on your experiences, what kind of advice would you give to women of my generation on friendship? Oh my God, this is such a responsibility. <laughs> Um, be kind to yourself. I think that's the advice I would give you as a friend. Um, your 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 needs really shift and change, especially at this time of life that you're in right now. Um, partly because you're learning yourself very actively right now, um, and that's always surprising. Uh, and I think while we're in that process of learning ourselves, we don't always behave as we would like to be remembered or we would like to believe that we're capable of. Um, and I, I just think, you know, be, be kind to yourself about it um, and, and, and understand that other people are going through it too. And now I, I feel like an expert. <laughs> Good. 
good boys here. Oh, thank you. Start singing. This book deals so much with looking back on the past and seeing different versions of yourself. And I was just wondering, when you were looking at previous Susannas, was there ever one that you were envious of? And if so, how did you deal with that in present? The one who didn't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, I, I don't think I was actually envious. Um, I mean, one of the benefits in writing like this is that you see you see the cumulative effect of every lesson you've learned. And, and that's what I was trying to articulate. Like, what is every lesson? I wanted each chapter to be like, what, what is the lesson that I have learned through going through this and behaving this way and interacting with this particular woman? And how did I carry that forward? Um, I, I'm, I, I mean, sh there are times when I've liked myself in particular ways for particular reasons, but I actually feel like, you know, the person who's this age with this perspective is exactly right for how I see myself. Um, so I don't, I don't think that I missed any particular phase so much. Um, if anything, it was more cringy of just like, uh, you know. <laughs> you make it sound easy the um, the putting into language of all these complexities it's really easy yeah <laughs> so anyone who's ever tried it knows that it's not so I'm curious um, whose prose you love and look to as far as learning how to write so beautifully the prose I love um, I think the prose I love is poetry and um, it really when I I really remember being in college and, and reading Renaissance poetry, especially John Milton, and that just sort of woke me up to uh, the way surprising language and surprising combinations um, can have an emotional effect um, and, and deliver you somewhere that you haven't been taken before. Um, so, so that was a really big influence. Um, I, I don't. I wouldn't. I, I don't really know where to begin, and I'd be afraid of beginning because then someone will say, "Well, but how come you left so and so off that list?" And so, I read. I read a lot, though, <laughs> and I never read bad writing. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so for much. Thanks, Betty.